All right, thank you so much. I, I am so honored to be here. Thank you to Dr. Orient and, and the board of, of AAPS for uh, being so kind and welcoming. Um, you may not be aware of this, but there was just this year a big fight to change the way death is determined in the United States. The American Academy of Neurology petitioned the Uniform Law Commission to change the UDDA, the Uniform Determination of Death Act, to make brain death standards looser. Uh, there was a big fight, and Dr. Sheila Page and the board sent a letter to the Uniform Law Commission, joining many other letters from other medical, pro-life medical organizations and disability groups. Praise the Lord, in September of this year, the Uniform Law Commission tabled their plans to revise it. So for now, we have a reprieve. But uh, as of October 11th, just a few weeks ago, the American Academy of Neurology came out since they couldn't get it pushed through by force of law, they have now published in the journal Neurology a new set of brain death guidelines for diagnostic purposes, which I will review for you at the end of the talk. So this is an ongoing, ongoing struggle. Uh, the book, I want to tell you, I've donated two big boxes of books uh, as a fund fundraiser for the AAPS, so all proceeds will go to uh, the AAPS. And if you are a medical student or a resident, your book is free. So please help yourself. So here we go. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Scott, for keeping the energy going. I got to go fast, too. Uh, I, I think the tragic death of actress Anne Hesch really showcases uh, some of the controversies in brain death determination. If you remember, her Mini Cooper ran off the road last year, August 5th. Um, she was communicating at the scene, but by uh, August 11th, uh, her spokesperson said she was not expected to survive, and indeed her doctors declared her brain dead uh, that same night. So because brain death equals legal death in the state of California, the Los Angeles Times reported her death with the following morning paper on August 12th. But the New York Times and the Washington Post held their obituaries until her death by organ harvesting because Anne was a registered organ donor. Her organs were removed and she actually died August 14th. And people ask, well, what, what's with that? So the Washington Post, I mean, how often do I get to agree with the Washington Post? <laughs> the Washington Post obituaries editor, Adam Burnside, said it's black and white. There's no gray area here. If you are on life support, you're still alive. Other publications can make their own judgment about when they're comfortable publishing. I'm comfortable when someone is actually dead, right? So when is someone actually dead? Well, you know, biologically, we want to talk about truth and science here. We're, we're medical people. Uh, the definition biologically is death is the loss of the integrated functioning of the organism as a whole. I mean, during life, our many systems work together in seamless harmony. Uh, when we die, the processes promoting life transition to processes promoting decay, uh, and there, a line is crossed. And most faith traditions do define death as equivalent with biological death, and traditionally it is the departure of the spirit that causes that loss of bodily integration. This is a cute little old gal, Janina Kolkowitz. In 2014, 91-year-old Janina was declared dead. but had spontaneous return of circulation and woke up in the morgue feeling chilly and asking for tea and pancakes. <laughs> Here she is. But you know, and, and that's a happy story. She recovered, went home, but her problems were not over because the dead have no civil standing. She had to hire an attorney to get her pension reinstated and her death certificate revoked. And the other thing that, that Janina really well highlights, and, and this is something your patients probably need your help to understand, there's a difference between resuscitation and resurrection, okay? Janina was not resurrected. You, you cannot be, um, no mortal can come back from the dead outside of divine intervention. She was resuscitated, okay? She, I mean, but your patients will tell you, you know, my uncle Charlie, he died five times and doctors kept shocking him back alive, right? No. No, he, he was not dead. I mean, he was resuscitated. And so that's a, that's a key point that we need to keep coming back to. In fact, in times past, people were greatly concerned that death would not be declared prematurely, and they had little inventions like ye old safety coffin, right? Um, but the definition of death that had been the same for thousands of years changed with the beginning of heart transplant. Now, there had been two heart transplants in December of 1967. Both were 
very unsuccessful with the patients living from a few hours to a couple of weeks. But on New Year's Day, uh, January uh, 1968, this man, uh, Clive Haupt, a black man in South Africa, suffered a brain bleed while picnicking and was taken to Groot Shore uh, Hospital in South Africa. He was admitted under the care of a Dr. Hoffenberg, and that very same day, Dr. Hoffenberg was approached by Dr. Kristen Bernard and the transplant team and, and asked to declare help dead. Now, Dr. Hoffenberg was kind of uncomfortable declaring a man with a beating heart dead, but you know, the, one of the transplant surgeons said, God, Bill, what sort of heart are you going to give us? I mean, meaning if they allowed Clive Haupt's heart to stop, it would very quickly become unsuitable for a transplant. So under considerable pressure, the next morning, Dr. Hoffenberg relented and pronounced Haupt dead, and his beating heart was removed and given to a retired white dentist. Doctors noted that you know, this is a wonderful thing for transplant, but this is on pretty shaky ground, both ethically and legally. Uh, but that very same month, a, a group of 13 men at Harvard uh, Medical School convened to change the definition of death. And here's their landmark article. Um, interestingly, in this article, there is one reference. It's a reference to a speech by Pope Pius XII. There's no medical data on this paper at all. Um, they said in the article, our primary purpose is to define irreversible coma as a new criteria for death. All right, are comatose people dead, even if you think it might be irreversible? And who really knows? I mean, are, are you all omniscient? I mean, we do our best, right? But we don't know. Um, there were no new test studies or evidence that comatose people were dead. The committee only gave utilitarian justifications for this. They said the burden is great on patients who suffer permanent loss of intellect, on their families, on the hospitals, those who want their ICU beds, right? And obsolete criteria for the definition of brain death can lead to controversy in obtaining organs for transplantation. So utilitarian to the core. This redefinition allowed doctors to skirt the dead donor rule by simply declaring comatose people to be dead. And the dead donor rule is not a law, but it's an ethical standard. It says people must neither be alive when the organs are removed, nor can they be killed by the organ process of organ removal. It's a, so basically, brain death is a legal fiction. It is not true biological death, but it's a legal way to remove human rights from vulnerable people. There has only been one prospective study of brain death, and that was between 1970 and 1972. This study, um, you cannot find the bound volume anymore, but if you go on Google Books, it's a available as a free ebook if you want to see the study. Um, of 226 brains autopsied, 10 were grossly normal. Only 40% showed what was called at the time respirator brain, which we would call ischemic brain infarction. And so the investigators concluded it was not possible to verify that a diagnosis made before cardiac arrest by any set or subset of criteria would invariably correlate with a diffusely destroyed brain. They called for more and bigger studies. Guess what? Zero. No one has ever done this again. So between 1968 and 1981, it was the wild, wild west in the realm of brain death determination. You could be declared brain dead in Alaska, Arkansas, or Colorado, but not in Ohio. And if you were unlucky enough to live in Connecticut, they had two standards for death, one for people generally, and then kind of a more looser one for organ donors. So this was an untenable situation. So in 1981, a presidential commission was convened to determine if the Harvard Ad Hoc Committee's redefinition of death was truly death. So this commission, they maintained at least a biological definition of death. Um, they thought that we should be looking for the integrative functioning of the organism as a whole. But they believed that the brain was the master integrator of the body. And without the brain, the integration would very quickly be lost. And they also asserted that Technologies such as ventilators simply mask the fact, uh, the fact that death had already occurred. And these, uh, this was then codified into a model law, which has now been adopted by, in some form by all the states. And this is the Uniform Determination of Death Act, under which we can uh, declare people dead in two ways. 
One is the irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory function, or number two, the irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brainstem, is death. But is the brain the master integrator? Uh, in 1998, Dr. Alan Schumann disproved this when he documented 175 cases of brain dead people, people who were dead enough to be offered to be organ donors. That's how dead enough they were, right? Uh, but they lived after this declaration of dead, one for ultimately more than 20 years. And honestly, we could have had many more, except for the fact that a brain death determination so quickly becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You either become an organ donor or generally your care is withdrawn. These brain dead so-called people had wound healing, spontaneous movements, they maintain body temperature, they mount appropriate stress responses, they fight infections, they go through puberty, they gestate pregnancy. A recent article I saw on brain death and pregnancy reported of 35 cases studied, 27 babies were born alive. How many corpses give birth, right? Uh, this is Dr. Doya Nguyen. She's a pathologist and a moral theologian specializing in end-of-life ethics. She says, you know, does the ventilator mass death? I mean, life and death are mutually exclusive. There's, does machinery somehow have the power of producing life? And if you think about it, a ventilator only insufflates oxygenated air, it doesn't cause any respiration as occurs in all our organs of our body or across the capillary alveolar interspace. You need a live body to, to respire. And here's a good point. If it is true that the ventilator masks death, are there other ICU patients who are actually dead and are fooling us, right? <laughs> I mean, honestly, think about your, your gross anatomy cadaver. If you put it on a ventilator, would it have looked alive? Ridiculous, it's crazy. So, because people realize, gosh, you know, Dr. Schumann is quite right, these, these people don't seem to bi be biologically dead. In 2008, another President's Council was convened, and they noted that Dr. Schumann's work left two options. Either one, we have to abandon the neurological criteria for determining death, or we have to develop a new rationale to justify it. Okay, what do you think they chose? Uh-huh, number two. So they made up a new term. They called it total brain failure, and they made up a very mystical sounding idea. An organism is no longer alive when it ceases to perform. The fundamental vital work of a living organism, the work of self-preservation achieved through the organism's need-driven commerce with the surrounding world. Okay, what, what does that boil down to? They said it boils down to breathing and consciousness for whatever reason, no reason, any reason, right? So, and just like that, the definition of death changed from biological to philosophical. So since it's been established that brain-dead people have continued integrated biological function, the definitions of death have shifted to questions of the essence of humanity. Interestingly, the president of the 2008 council, uh, Dr. Edmund Pellegrino, disagreed and wrote on a minority dissent saying ideally a full definition would link the concept of life or death with its clinical manifestations, things like the things we've known since antiquity, loss of sentience, loss of heartbeat, breathing, modeling coldness of skin, rigidity, eventual putrefaction. I mean, let's, let's look at truth and science. And in fact, the 2008 President's Council failed to reflect the science. I mean, people in total brain failure have brain function. Did you know 20% of those tested still have EEG activity? And over half still have a functioning hypothalamus, which is a part of the brain. Uh, they have wound healing. They fight infections. I was right there in the operating room. I'm so ashamed to tell you, as a resident, I provided an anesthetic for an organ donor, and he reacted to surgery just like everybody else. But because my authorities told me that was a dead man, I stood there and let them dismember him before my eyes. And the reason I do this is I don't want that to happen to all of you. And I don't want that to happen to you medical students or you residents. Thank you. Thank you very much. So am I mad? Yeah, I'm mad. Um, did, the, did you see Dr. Scott's slide about, about when the baby's heart starts beating and when the brain develops? Okay, so these people are people. It, the brain is not the master integrator. I mean, these, these are, are people with, with 
their spirits in their bodies. Um, the lack of breathing in consciousness that, that the President's Council brought up is too broad because it would include fetuses in early pregnancy that don't yet breathe or have consciousness. And though people dispute whether fetuses are persons, no one claims that they are dead. So in 2010, the American Academy of Neurology came out with what they called an evidence-based guideline for determining brain death. And, and they said, you, it's a bedside diagnosis. You, you need to check for uh, response. You need to check for brainstem reflexes. They said ancillary studies in general are not usually needed. But if you read the manuscript of this evidence-based guideline, they end up saying, many of the details of the clinical neurologic examination cannot be established by evidence-based methods. It must be emphasized that this guidance is opinion-based. So what this is, an opinion-based guideline masquerading as an evidence-based guideline. And if you look at their evidence, look at this. How good is this evidence? Insufficient, insufficient, weak, insufficient, insufficient, paucity of evidence. And they end up saying, because of the deficiencies in the evidence base, Clinicians must exercise considerable judgment when applying the criteria in specific circumstances. In 2012, Dr. Ari Jaffe did a survey of neurologists. Nearly half equated brain death with death because of a higher brain concept, the, the personhood concept, the, the, what people say when, when they offer organ donation. The person he was isn't there anymore. Okay, he's a disabled person now. Does that make him not a person at all? And more than half of the neurologists did not think brain death was the same as cardiac death. I mean, do we have two kinds of death? All right, Jahai McMath. I was so honored to meet Dr. Alita Eck, who took care of Jahai McMath in New Jersey. And thank you so much for, for caring for this little girl. Um, Jahai McMath's case is very, very important because she unquestionably met the American Academy of Neurology Brain Death Standards and the, and the Pediatric Brain Death Standards come to that. So her case was that she was 13 years old, she had sleep apnea, she had a cardiac arrest uh, due to post-op bleeding after tonsillectomy and palate reconstruction. She had a correctly performed brain death diagnosis. She had three neurologists, three neurologists, who, who said that she fulfilled the, the guidelines. She had four isoelectric EEGs. She had a radioisotope scan with no intracranial blood throw. She had three apnea tests, but her parents looked at their little girl. She is warm. She's moving occasionally. They said, she's no way dead. So after a legal battle, she was um, able to be removed from California, who wrote her a death certificate. Her death certificate in California said, pending investigation as cause of death. She was airlifted to New Jersey, where, where Dr. Eck was able to care for her. Well, what happened to her there? Three months after going to New Jersey, she got her period and started to go through puberty. I mean, how many corpses menstruate, honestly? Um, she began to respond to commands and showed heart rate variability to her mother's voice. She had an MRI, and on this MRI, she had a lot of damage in her brain stem, but her cortex, uh, her thalamus, her basal, the upper structures were fairly maintained intact. And though she had fulfilled those guidelines for brain death, two neurologists later testified she was not brain dead, but in a minimally conscious state. Interestingly, the new brain death guidelines that just came out a couple weeks ago, she would have fulfilled those as well and incorrectly been diagnosed as dead. So how did she recover despite this brain death and, and no cerebral blood flow? There's a, a neurologic diagnosis that is not well known, um, but should be well known. It's called global ischemic penumbra. It was described in 1999 by a Brazilian neurologist, Dr. Cicero Coimba. Um, what it is is that I, when you have normal blood flow, it's at 50 mil per 100 gram per minute. As this decreases towards zero, First, you go through a period where there's not enough flow for function. So at 20 mil per 100 gram per minute, your EEG becomes isoelectric and you're not gonna have a responding neuro exam. But tissue necrosis doesn't happen until 10 mil per 100 gram per minute. So a GIP is sort of like the way the lights go out in your house during a power outage, but the wiring is not destroyed. This is a potentially reversible situation during which time, if you do a neuro exam, you're gonna come up with brain death every time. 
Dr. Schumann says this is not a hypothesis, it's a mathematical necessity. I mean, if you're going from 50 to zero, you're gonna pass between 20 and 10, right? And the intracranial blood flow studies are not sensitive enough to pick this up. So here's the, the new guideline, just uh, come, came out October 11th, uh, a couple weeks ago. The last one, as I mentioned, was an opinion-based guideline masquerading as an evidence-based guideline. This one comes right out and says it's a consensus guideline, but a consensus of who? Well, look, a panel of experts, okay. <laughs> well, who, who were these experts? Let's take a look. Um, the panel leadership screened disclosure forms and CVs for financial and intellectual conflict of interest, and they excluded those individuals whose profession and intellectual bias would diminish the credibility of the guideline in the eyes of the intended users. So anyone who might have disagreed with them was not admitted to the panel of experts. Okay, well, what else do we have here? So, they say that because of the lack of high quality evidence on the subject, well, we have been diagnosing people brain dead for nearly 60 years. Do you think there should be some high quality evidence for it by now? No, there's no evidence for this. So what did they do? They used a novel evidence-informed formal consensus process, a modified Delphi process. Well, who's heard of a Delphi process? I hadn't, so I had to look it up. So what they did is they had their panel of experts submit anonymous recommendations, and then they went through three rounds of anonymous voting to decide what these guidelines were gonna be, right? Well, the Delphi process, if you look at it, it has a weakness. It says, if the individuals in a group are misinformed about a topic, which I maintain on brain death they are, the use of Delphi will, like a traditional group meeting, only add confidence to their ignorance. Well, splendid. So the panel was not only screened to exclude dissenting voices, but in addition, they used a method which exacerbates the echo chamber effect. So what did they say? So brain death is some um, in what happens in individuals with a catastrophic brain injury with no function of the brain as a whole, a state that must be permanent. Well, what do these terms mean? So brain as a whole is the latest attempt to justify the brain death concept. I told you in 1968 they had a utilitarian justification. In 1981 it was the brain as master integrator. In 2008 it was the fundamental vital work hypothesis. Uh, brain as the whole was recently reported by neurologist uh, James Burnett in the August 2023 issue of Neurology as a justification still being hashed out. Here's what he says, while the brain as a whole criterion remains in an early stage of refinement, it probably entails cessation of all major brain functions required by the whole brain criterion, particularly those of the brainstem, but not the relatively minor functions such as hypothalamic neurosecretion and perhaps random disorganized EEG activity. So brain as a whole allows people who still have partial brain function with EEG electric activity and a functioning hypothalamus to be declared brain dead in a state that must be permanent. Now the, there's the quote from the paper. The panel chose to use the term permanent to mean function was lost and one, will not resume spontaneously, and two, medical interventions will not be used to attempt restoration of function. So this definition, will not be used, implies that it might have been used, and if used, it might have been successful. So this means that people who could possibly be resuscitated can be declared dead. All right, remember Janina Kolkowitz? If you can be resuscitated, you are not biologically dead. Interestingly too, this definition of permanent does not comply with most states' laws that have adopted the UDDA because the UDDA states irreversible, cannot be reversed, un incapable of being reversed, okay, a difference. So your, your patients have legal standing in most states to, to question this. So the, here's the, what they, they'd want you to check, so unresponsiveness, right, but we all know that the inability to respond is not the same as unconsciousness. I mean, people with a high spinal cord lesion can't respond, but they're perfectly conscious. People in the GIP state that I mentioned are in a place where they might be able to be responsive, but uh, conscious in, if you fix them, but not able to respond at this time. 
Um, they say there should be no motor response to noxious stimulus, but they'll go on to say, it can sometimes be challenging to determine whether a movement is cerebrally or spinally mediated based solely on clinical examination, so good luck to you, right? Um, they want to uh, have no, they want to have certain brainstem reflexes absent, whereas the UDDA stipulates all functions of the entire brain must uh, be absent. And they want you to do an apnea test uh, which I'll discuss in a moment, but they go on to say, and they have parameters that they list, selection of targets for this challenge is arbitrary because no scientific data demonstrate specific PaCO2 above which medullary chemoreceptors would prompt respiration if they were functional. So we don't know. The apnea test is one that is done when you take someone with a brain injury, you insufflate oxygen, and you remove them from the ventilator for up to 10 minutes. Absolutely the worst thing you can do to someone with a brain injury. Rising levels of CO2 cause vasodilatation in the brain, increasing intracranial pressure. People who have had this done and were found not to meet the criteria on the first test were found to be brain dead on the second try because you, you made them brain dead on purpose. So I. I I like to use this comparison. I mean, doing an apnea test on a brain injured person is like making a patient with angina at rest run on a treadmill. What do you think is going to happen? This is an unethical test, has no benefit for the patient, only benefits some unspecified others who might want their organs or their ICU bed. This is unethical. But despite the fact that it's unethical and can cause brain damage, guess what? The new guidelines say that clinicians do not need to obtain consent before doing this evaluation, unless stipulated by the institution's policy or state laws or regulations. This is the same language the Uniform Law Commission recently declined to adopt when it tabled the RUDDA on September 22nd. And as far as ancillary testing, the guidelines emphasize that brain death is a bedside diagnosis. They go on to say that all ancillary tests have shortcomings and none are 100% sensitive or specific. Now, wouldn't it be nice to kind of know pretty much 100% if someone was dead? I mean, this is just nuts. So to conclude, uh, this is quoting Verheige and, and colleagues, heart beating or non-heart beating organ procurement from patients with impaired consciousness is de facto a concealed practice of physician assisted death and therefore violates both criminal law and the central tenet of medicine not to harm patients. I would go further since brain dead organ harvesting directly kills the patient, it's euthanasia. Advances in medical science have made these old definitions obsolete. I mentioned earlier global ischemic penumbra. If this has the potential to save people once written off as brain dead, if it would only be recognized. The use of functional MRI has allowed early detection of covert consciousness in patients with acute severe traumatic brain injury. And hypothermia, as commonly used in resuscitation, can delay the return of brain functioning after rewarming by as long as seven days, according to Sam Parnia, a resuscitation expert. The new guidelines stipulate 24 hours. How many of these people might wake up if their physicians only waited a little longer? Uh, brain dead harvesting is uh, unethical because in order to allow continued transplantation, the definition of death has been changed from a biological to a philosophical definition. Human life continues as long as integrated vital functions continue, even with the help of technology. And even transplant proponents like Drs. Miller and Trug write, brain dead donors remain alive. And donors declared dead according to circulatory criteria are not known to be dead at the time their organs are procured. Dr. Vedix, the first author on the 2010 uh, guideline and an author on the 2023, says the diagnosis of brain death is driven by whether there is a transplantation program or whether there are transplantation surgeons. I do not think brain death examination now in practice would have much, if any, meaning if it were not for the sake of transplantation. Brain death harvesting is illegal, well, it's, I wish it were illegal, it's unethical um, because there are people who survive this diagnosis. This is Zach Dunlap. Zach uh, was in a four-wheeler accident in 2007. The helicopter was landing with the transplant team to harvest his organs as he had been declared brain dead and was a registered organ donor. When his cousin, it wasn't the medical staff, it was his cousin, took out his pocket knife and scratched the bottom of Zach's foot, causing him to withdraw. 
Even then, the nurse didn't believe. They said, oh, that's just a reflex. So then he put his fingernail and dug under the nail bed, and Zach pretty much took a swing at him. And then the nurse called the doctor. The man made a, a complete recovery. I mean, you just see he's got a little trach scar there. He's now married and has a daughter. The public is being denied truly informed consent when they sign a donor card. This is something that one of the people that read my, my book said. When I considered being an organ donor, I was under the assumption that once I was pronounced dead, all my organs shut down, including my entire brain, my body dead and cold, then I would certainly share any parts of my body. I was wrong. David Rodriguez Arias is a, a professor of moral philosophy at Grenada. He says, policy making becomes indoctrination. Give the gift of life. Have you heard that one before? Whenever public opinions and preferences are intentionally manipulated in ways that destroy or prevent citizens' independent judgment and rational deliberation. The history of death determination in the context of organ donation can be described as an indoctrinating attempt to settle a moral controversy. So what are our action steps? First, become aware of the updated information on organ harvesting and transplant and this ever-changing definition of brain death. And educate your patients so they can make good end-of-life decisions. Remove your name from organ donor lists and document your refusal to be an organ donor in your electronic medical record. Don't sign an organ donation card. And if you have signed one, have your permission removed at the DMV. But this legally may not be enough. Uh, the 2006 update to the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act now mandates that individuals who refuse to donate must explicitly state so. If family is not reasonably available and there is no documented evidence of the decedent's choice not to donate, even the administrator of the hospital shall make an anatomic gift of the decedent's body part. So you, if you're incapacitated and they can't find your family within a reasonable time, if you don't have a specific refusal, the hospital administrator, someone whose interests may not be the same as yours, can make you an organ donor. All right, so what if you are asked to perform a determination of brain death? So I asked Dr. Alan Schumann, uh, who we saw earlier in the presentation, what his practice was, as he was a pediatric neurologist at UCLA for many years. He's now retired. He says this is what he did. Explain that the apnea test is unethical and do not perform one. If it is performed by others, you may cite the results. But there's no ethical reason to do that to a brain-injured patient. You should refuse. Um, you may perform the neurologic exam according to the latest guidelines and chart that the guidelines with citation have been fulfilled. You do not have to state that the patient is dead or even brain dead, but rather that the patient fulfills the criteria for brain death in your state. You do not have to imply that you think the guidelines are valid or that the law is correct. And you should discuss your ethical stance with your colleagues and with your patients as appropriate. So, thank you very much. Our, our website is respectforhumanlife.com. The, the, the new book, The Brain Death Fallacy, is, is, it's available out there for, for a fundraiser for, for AAPS. It's available on Amazon if you get home and, and wanted to get a copy after all. If you are a resident or a medical student, you are welcome to a free copy. Thank you very much. <laughs>